As therapies for hairy cell leukemia have improved, the survival has become much longer. Uh, for example, when the only effective therapy was splenectomy, the median survival for hairy cell leukemia was about four years. Uh, and in contrast, nowadays patients who have a good response to therapy will have a survival comparable to age-matched age controls. Uh, and so it is imperative to keep in mind survivorship issues uh, in these patients with chronic diseases uh, and carefully select therapies that are not gonna have toxicities that overlap with their other comorbidities. And as the population ages, it's imperative that we develop therapies that are tolerable for patients uh, who are older and have other medical problems. There are conceptual unmet needs, and then there's some practical unmet needs. The conceptual unmet needs uh, revolve around diagnosis. As I said at the beginning, this is a disease entity in which you have to think about the disease in order to get the diagnosis. And I've seen patients anecdotally who had been seen by other hematologists, even at credible institutions, where the thought never came up. And the hematopathologist did not dispense a diagnosis of hairy cell leukemia because it wasn't entertained and because the ordering physician didn't entertain the diagnosis. So there's a big diagnostic problem. There is a little bit of a conceptual problem as to how to put this in the spectrum of indolent lymphoproliferative diseases. You ask me, where did it come from? What's the etiology? How does it occur? How do people get it? I think there are open questions in a relatively rare disease uh, in trying to determine where the disease comes from. We also have a few conceptual issues regarding uh, the disease and its course because the course of hairy cell leukemia has been so profoundly affected by the purine nucleoside drugs. Before this, I still remember when what we had was splenectomy and after that alpha interferon. And the disease course generally was not so prolonged. Now in the era of purine nucleoside drugs, the disease course can be measured in decades. But there are patients, and I don't just mean patients who have a variable form of hairy cell leukemia, but there are patients with classic hairy cell leukemia whose disease course is short and time to relapse between treatment episodes of purine nucleoside drugs is measured in one to two to three years. It would be nice to know who those patients are. And if we knew that, and if we had some biological marker, it would lend itself to doing clinical trials with combined or combination treatments in order to either delay relapse or to affect some change in the natural history. Femurafenib, which is a BRAF inhibitor has been studied in hairy cell leukemia and has shown very high response rates. It's currently being studied with obinutuzumab uh, to try to deepen and lengthen those responses. Um, also, ibrutinib, which is a BTK inhibitor, is currently being studied in both variant and classical hairy cell leukemia. That study is still accruing and should be finishing up soon, and we'll be able to see the results of that study, uh, hopefully published very soon. Uh, in addition, uh, purine nucleoside analogs have been studied in combination with rituximab, uh, and it's clear that rituxan does help to deepen and lengthen the responses when given in combination with purine analogs. Uh, and so one of the open questions now is uh, whether rituxan should be added to upfront therapy. I think that's still a uh, clinical trial type of question, uh, but as we refine our risk stratification profiling, we may be able to identify those patients uh, at higher risk of early disease progression, and it may make sense to add rituxan to the purine analogs in those cases. The natural combination um, approach that has been studied already in the past is combination purine nucleoside drug with rituximab, the monoclonal anti-CD20 antibody. Now this therapy is highly effective. The question is whether it's necessary. So the induction of remission is almost 100%. However, the cost is severe immune suppression and no clear evidence that the duration of remission is prolonged by the intervention. Again, until we can identify who those patients are, whose remission duration to purine nucleosides will be relatively short, it's going to be hard to incorporate a second or third line agent into initial management because the risk of adverse events might be greater than the likelihood of favorable outcome for a minority population. But if you could identify genes that drive the disease in a different way, 
then it would be natural to combine purine nucleosides with a more effective monoclonal like moxitumumab or a BRAF inhibitor with a moxitumumab or a tuximab, maybe even do away with purine nucleoside drugs because of their immunosuppressive effects and needs for, for prophylactic antibiotics. But again, I think we need to know a little bit more about biology to isolate a different risk group. 